we are back on our Monday, Wednesday schedule. So odds are if you're an upperclassman, you've walked past this thing for like three years in the Science Center and never once really thought, stopped to think about what it actually is. Maybe you indulged during pre-frosh and actually read the little tourist-friendly signs describing what this thing is. But this is, one of, this is the first uh, electromechanic computers named the Mark I from many years ago that was actually invented by a professor and a graduate student by the name of Howard Aiken here in physics. And it was meant to be an automatic calculator. I thought I'd rattle off a few fun facts here. Namely, one, it did indeed handle some non-trivial amounts of math, namely up to 23 significant digits. So that in and of itself is impressive and that that could take a human some amount of time. But in terms of the weight, this thing was 10,000 pounds, and what you see in the Science Center is only a portion of it. Most of it has actually been dismantled. And in terms of its performance, a multiplication took six seconds, a division took 15.3 seconds, and a logarithm or trigonometric function took over one minute. So of course, contrast this with your Dell laptops, your MacBook Airs and whatnot, which you know, maybe are annoying when they're five pounds these days to carry around in your backpack. And surely, mathematically, they can perform these calculations instantly. But I thought I would give you a sense of just how exciting technology was some years ago, uh, replete with not only black and white footage and that voice that seems to be omnipresent from the 30s and 40s, uh, this is a little look back. It's about a uh, minute long as to the history and the utility of that Mark I computer you've been ignoring for some years here. <laughs> User error. mathematical and mechanical skill is this great new automatic calculator at Harvard University. Intricate problems in mathematics put through the machine in coded form on tape are accurately solved in a minute fraction of the time required for human calculation. Designed to expedite all forms of mathematical and scientific research, the giant mechanical brain will work for the United States Navy until war's end. It was a magical time. So uh, do if nothing else. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, do, if nothing else, perhaps take a modicum more interest when walking past that machine, because there actually is a lot of compelling history there. And you might have heard terms like punch cards and tape with regard to how you actually feed input into a computer. Back in the day, you actually toggled switches, and you literally fed in cards, pieces of paper with holes in them that represented zeros and ones and other such instructions. We've moved beyond that, certainly now, with our keyboards and such. But there's a lot of history on this campus in particular. So perhaps at least pause the next time you walk past. Last week, we introduced not only the course, and not only Scratch, but some of these fundamentals that we're going to now start to take for granted, namely how to represent information. And it's not that we're going to dwell on things like zeros and ones and bits and such in this course. We're very quickly going to start taking them for granted that somehow we have this ability to store numbers and data. But just to tie this week to last week, I thought I'd see if we could get eight brave volunteers to join me up here to hammer home one of last week's lessons. So how about you three there in the center? Four, five, six, uh, let's go over here, seven, and Rob, eight. Come on up. So you have to be comfortable, as always, appearing here on camera. We have eight pieces of paper, one for each of you here. And if you could each align yourselves on stage, consistent with the order here, Rob, you will be, let's say, the, Rob will be number one. Over there on the right, if you want to be the twos place, if you'd like to be the eights place, I'll find the fours place in a moment. If you'd like to be the fours place, how about the, let's see, the, come on, sixteenths place, and three more, thirty twos place, sixty fours place, and 128th place. So if you want to go ahead and up uh, in front of the stage here so all can see, indeed hold your number outwardly. What these guys each have, and Rob, do you mind shifting down just a little bit? 
So we have now places 1 through 128. And recall one of the takeaways last week is that this system of binary, of base 2, is not all that dissimilar to what we've been using for years, namely base 10 or decimal, where we have the 1's place, the 10's place, the 100's place, and so forth. Instead, in the world of computers, we tend to use powers of 2, the 2 really deriving from the binary nature of bits, zeros and 1's. And so our column placeholders are the 1's place, the 2's place, the 4's, 8, 16. In other words, instead of multiplying by 10, you multiply by 2. But we built up from this numeric capability last week to actually express numbers. And does anyone recall what the code or the system was that maps numbers to letters in computers typically? So it's something called ASCII, A-S-C-I-I, -I, which is just a code, a mapping between numbers and letters. And recall that that mapping looked a little something like this. And the chart itself is certainly not worth memorizing, but a few key values like uh, 65 for capital letter A, 97 for lowercase a, a few of those tend to be useful just to kind of ingrain in your mind so that they can be handy when we're actually writing code. Now, these guys have on the backs of each of their sheets here a little cheat sheet. It's round one, round two, round three. And in each of these rounds, their little cheat sheet advises them to either raise their hand or just stand there. If they've raised their hand, they're meant to be representing a 1. If they're just standing there, they're meant to be representing a 0. We've got a three-letter word to represent with an 8-bit byte, an ASCII character, if you will. So let's see what three-letter word we can spell with these folks here. So if you all, as our volunteers, round 1, could raise or not raise your hand as instructed by your cheat sheet. What number first is being represented by these eight volunteers? Yeah, 66, right? Because we've got the 64's place plus the 2's place. Add them together, get 66. And that letter then maps to? Capital B. All right, so we're on our way. How about round two? What are we representing now? That's definitely not universal agreement. How about again? OK, I heard more 79. So if you just stole the person next to you's number, you are correct. So the number 79 maps to what letter here? B O. OK, so now the third and final round. Round three, go. What number do we have here? Yeah, so we have 87. And again, you can get this by adding up the numbers in front of anyone with their hand raised. 87 maps to? A W, so W, and so we have a nice word here, bow, often pronounced by last year's class as bow, which didn't really make for a good ending. But if you would take your bow, we've indeed spelled out B-O-W. So congrats to these guys here. If you want to head off stage left, we have a little parting gift for you in the way of a waiver form. So we now have this ability to express numbers to express letters. And so now let's start taking this for granted. And indeed, let's transition from last week's exploration of Scratch, which was very user friendly and graphical, but also very limited. Even if you've never programmed before, you probably found it or are finding it or will find it difficult to do certain things because the program isn't necessarily as expressive as you might like it to be or that or you're just not very familiar with it yet. So it just takes some time finding your way around. And allow me to emphasize that this point um, in the course, right before study cards are due, there's quite the spectrum of students in this course. In, in the weeks 0 through 2, we typically run this risk historically of either kind of boring those more comfortable because they're coming in with more background. The goal of lectures in particular is to start filling in any holes that you might have from your prior experience, whether formal in classes or just self-taught. And for those less comfortable, making sure that we equip you with the same basic mental model and understanding of some basics so that all of us in just a week's or two time can start having a conversation on exactly the same level. Now, if you're finding that even Scratch is kind of stressing you out, is taking a ridiculous amount of time, realize that all of these things get easier. And consistently, every year, even when I took it myself, the best strategy in general, and maybe it's too late for this first piece set, is just start these things early. They'll typically go out the door. Uh, they'll go out the door by Fridays each week, which means you have the weekend if you'd like to sort of ease into it. The walkthroughs are on Sundays. And really, the key to programming is not to start on, say, Wednesday night and say, I'm going to finish this by morning or by midnight, because it's just not fun. And you can't think necessarily 
necessarily clearly. And there's just a huge advantage to being able to walk away from some problem. I've lost count over the years of just how many bugs I've solved just by randomly thinking about them passively throughout the day. And I'm like, oh, so that was what I was doing wrong. And to allow yourself that opportunity honestly makes things easier, makes things more fun, and certainly eliminates the stress that's inevitably induced in any course by postponing things to the last minute. So let me get off that soapbox there and now start to transition us to this programming language C. So today we begin a more traditional programming language. It's an older language, but it's the one that really sets the direction of a lot of today's modern languages, which we'll then begin to visit toward the end of the semester in the form of PHP and JavaScript and some other things as well. And what's nice about C, as we'll soon see, is that it's relatively simple. And it's not going to feel that way, particularly to those less comfortable, most likely the first week or so. But relatively speaking, you can learn this language in just a few weeks. Contrast that with some human language, a spoken language. You typically don't master a new language after just a few weeks of practice. It can take months, it can take semesters, it can take years. So just realize that the scope of the languages we're about to learn is actually fairly narrow. So here's a little program that we saw last.